Hi everyone, and in this lecture we're going to look at the roots of the United States, the historical and social context. So as we get into American literature, one of the things we have to understand is so much of it is rooted, is, is influenced by what's gone on, by the history and the social dynamics that have created this country and continue to influence the what we write, who gets to write, when we get to say or are able to speak to certain things. And so what I really want to do is give some really strong, some really good ideas about where and how our country is founded or how America or U.S. civilization developed. So we're really going to try to trace American literature and we're going to do that through looking at history. And we first have to understand when we talk about the United States and the culture that we know of today as American culture, we're largely looking at, first of all, what would be considered a Western view. That is a view shaped by Western culture. And Western culture largely means Western European culture. And that view is, at least for the, for the US and the US culture, only about 500 years old. That is, there have been people on the American continents for you know, for some some would say up. To, you know, some of the research says up to twenty thousand years, but when we talk about American literature, it, it seems narrowly defined as only the last five hundred years. And one of the most one of the important reasons or important things about American literature is that it emerged right at the beginning of print culture, and this is really big. This is this is very different from many many other. Um, cultures of which American literature is derived. This is very different from much of Western cultures, from European culture as a whole, from African and Asian cultures. We as a, as a nation started to develop at the same time printing was made accessible on a very large scale. It continues to get larger but as this country is forming we're finding it's at the same time that print is taking off. We're also a culture in a country that is, because of that print culture, the migration of you know, many, many different people from many, many different cultures, as they come over, much of it is documented or it is performed by writing cultures. That is so much of people coming here to the US, to the colonies, was premised in writing cultures. And we see that even in things like charters, right? So in very early colonial times, in order for people to come over to any part, there had to be an established charter. And a charter is a written document saying, yes, these people can go inhabit that land, right? Our government is founded on a written document, the Constitution. Our declaration against uh, the British was a written document. So we see this writing as a central piece of American identity. We also see that American literature and or the development of the US and even literature was initially driven by and accounted for markets, right? Print culture took off in part because people were making money from it. People came to the Americas in part because there was money to be made in one way or another. Selling the charters, using the, using the resources, um, you know, the, the rise of the slave trade, that there's so many different markets that, that pushed for the development of this country. And we do have to recognize that, I mean, um, at least for, the, for North America, so much of, you know, the, the development was dominated and traded among different European powers. This is through treaties and proclamations, but you know, how this country developed was very large, very strongly influenced by the traditions inherited from different European powers, whether it's Spain or England or the Dutch or France, all of them play different roles in how we develop as a nation and thus influence our writing. So why did the U.S. become pivotal in world history? And again, I think this is important because as we start to look at some of the text, there is a sense of identity. There is a sense of increasing belief about the importance of the U.S. within the country. Even as it's young, there's still a sense of being bigger than, um, bigger than one might imagine. 
Well, again, we come to market and economic forces. The resources that came to, that came in from the Amer from North America into Europe, or from both Americas, really did change. Really did change Europe's role in the world at large. You have to understand a little bit about world history in that. In the 14, you know, 13 and 1400s, Europe was this small backwater place compared to many other vibrant, rich cultures. The you know, the Muslim Empire was massive, and it was, you know, it was on the cutting edge of technology and science and all these different things that we don't always aren't always aware of. So when the U.S. does, or I'm sorry, when when Europe does actually find the Americas and starts to make use of its resources, it does make the, it does make Europe and then by connection the Americas and the U.S. much stronger economic forces on the global market. It also happened at a time in which you know these these different countries were looking to empire build, and by extension, as the United States became its own identity, it too sought to build an empire. And in fact, you can look at the history of the United States, and you can see not only does it expand uh, westward it, with manifest destiny, but it continually goes into other countries. You know, it, it does have a long history. From very early on with the Monroe Doctrine of invading other countries and in doing so reaping a lot of rewards and benefits and resources from it. It also was a place where initially excess and unwanted populations were sent were sent from Europe. So Europe took populations it did not want, in some cases, you know, prisoners and the like, and sent them to the America sent them to the Americas. Uh, I believe it's South Carolina was originally a penal colony. Well, not only does that happen in in the development of the U.S., but the U.S. continues to take in these excess and unwanted populations and creates its western frontier, where it continues to send within its own society excess and unwanted populations. So what happens is very fascinating. Other cultures largely disown populations, the excess and the unwanted populations. The U.S. actually holds on to its own excess and unwanted populations and puts them on the frontier. So they may not be part of mainstream society, but they're still serving the, the larger good. And so this in some ways reaps benefits and allows the country to become a, a more robust country over hundreds of years. The U.S. also became a, a great place for religious and social escapes, that is, people who are facing religious prosecution or social prosecution in one way, shape, or form, the colonies who are a potential place to escape to still have the society or still you know, be the people that they wanted to be. And so, and this, this is not surprising in that, or I should say one outcome of this is we have a very fierce belief in the individual and what the individual wants to do. And this is, this is in part because of that, right? Because people came here to escape the cultural pressures of not being allowed to be who they are. And then the, the, particularly again the US, it was a large, large space for food production. And there were two major types of food production. There was the, uh, there was the farming that took place, right? Lots and lots of land for harvesting wheat and rice and all of these, you know, vegetables and, and grains. But then there was also a large amount of land for cows and for other livestock to graze and therefore to increase the um, not just the the food supply but particularly the meat supply in fact it's part of why we became such a meat centric culture not just here but in the you know in first in developed countries we see a very very strong fixation on meat and in part that's because of you know what the the food production in the United States has afforded us so what drove Europeans to come to the Americas? Because we have to realize, I mean, getting in a boat and going six weeks into the, this wild ocean under extreme conditions does not sound like a good time to anyone. But lots of people still came to the Americas. So what did that? Well, first was European conflicts. There were lots and lots of wars in the 14, 15, and 1600s. You've got your Hundred Years War, you've got your Thirty Years War, you've got all sorts of wars ravaging Europe. And so anytime anybody is in a war-ravaged place, there is a tendency to see a population try to get away. In particular, we saw uh, 
lots of wars and challenges between Europe and the Muslim Empire, or empires by this point. Uh, the Muslim empires were largely in North Africa and the Middle East, and even in eastern parts of, uh, even, even butting up against Eastern Europe. In fact, if you're familiar with Dracula, uh, Dracula was based off of Vlad the Impaler, who was uh, a king. I'm sorry, he, he, was a, he was a lord, and he really fought off, or he attempted to fight off Muslims invading Eastern Europe for a time. And that was during this time, the 1400s, and well, he was during the 1400s, but the Muslim Empire continued to um, border against Europe, Europe for hundreds of years. We also saw in Spain in 1492, that same year that Columbus uh, sails across the Atlantic for the first time and encounters the American continents, and that same year, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella have kicked out, they have banished not only all the Jews, but all Muslims as well, right? And they've said, you know, the Jews and Muslims must go. They have to leave all of their gold, all of their money here, but they must go. So you can see there has been long tension, and not many people, not many people know this, but Spain was in fact um, part of the Muslim Empire for six or seven hundred years, from about the 800s until the 1400s. As I said, there were innumerable wars. Um, you know, the, the little word cloud there down on the bottom, here are just all the different countries that were involved in some way, shape, or form in the wars during the 14 and 1500s. I mean, you couldn't, you know, you, you didn't go a year without some war or some violence and some, you know, stress among different uh, countries and principalities rising up. There's also the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation was a religious um, response to the Catholicism. By the 1400s and early 1500s, Catholicism had, in many people's eyes, gotten become more corrupted than was tolerable, was working well beyond what was in the Bible, and this was also at the time that people were finally getting the word of the Bible in their hands. As I said, the printing press comes along, or you know, the, there is the printing press that had made the Bible largely available prior to this, it was only in the church's hands. Now everybody, or lots of people, were getting exposure to the Bible and asking questions about the church. So we see people like Martin Luther, King Henry VIII, and John Calvin. All of them are major figures and raising challenges and ultimately creating their own, either intentionally or unintentionally, creating their own denominations. Lutherans, Anglicans, Calvinists, uh, Calvinists, these are all people who, these are all denominations that broke off and are considered Protestant Christians. And notice in that word, Protestant, that first part, protest. They were protesting the ways in which Christianity was being presented to the masses. We also had people like the Pilgrims and the Puritans who, because of what was going on and because you had not just Christians fighting Muslims, but Christians fighting Christians, such as in the Thirty Years' War, they are not finding their place in society, and so part of many of them flee to the Americas so that they can establish what their view of Christianity is in a land unsullied by everything that's been going on in Europe. So we also see Europe as part of this global network, and trade and politics play a huge role in how Europeans end up in the Americas. So first we have America, uh, I'm sorry, Europe is encompassed. That is, it is surrounded uh, to the south and to the southeast. It has the Muslim Empire, which had really taken over and really had spread far with the fall of the Roman Empire. Not many people know this, but the Eastern Roman Empire uh, lasted until 1453, and it fell to Muslims. And so the Muslim empires have taken over northern Africa, have taken over the Middle East, and parts in are continually encroaching into Eastern Europe. And then to, you have the Muslim empire, and then you also have Russia. And so between these two forces, there's not many places for Europe to go. And if they want to participate in global politics and global trade at the time, they really have to deal with Muslims who at least uh, in, a, in a religious sense they, they have challenges with, um, or Russians who, you know, they, they identify as Christians at times. In fact, they view themselves as the third Rome, but also have different views and have different cultural points of view than much of Europe. 
So we have Russia that you know that that can be hard to deal with, as well as uh, the Muslim Empire. And that Muslim Empire is, of course, the Ottoman Empire. They t they sack Rome. I'm sorry, they sack Constantinople. And they really are a challenge for the Europeans to work with. They have taken over what's known as the Silk Road. And in taking over the Silk Road, they, you know, there are barriers for Europe. Europe has been regularly getting resources along the Silk Road from China and India. Uh, and this is being now challenged because, of course, they're dealing with the Ottoman Empire and things aren't necessarily going as smooth. So Europe is looking for other places or other ways to continue that Indian Ocean trade. Because the Indian Ocean in the 14 and 1500s is where it's at. That's where the major trading is going on because there's so many great civilizations there that are trading and giving, you know, finding the resources that they need. And Europe's kind of cut out of it. In fact, that's why Christopher Columbus goes east is because they, you know, they figure out, well, if we go east eventually, we're bound to find, you know, the, the find China and these other civilizations. The question was, how far do you go and how many supplies do you pack because you don't know how far it is. So this is what we see happen with Christopher Columbus and others is that the people of the 1400s knew the world was round. Students, you've heard the mythology of everybody thought the world was flat. No, most people in the, eight, in the 1400s knew the world was round. That wasn't in question. The question was if you were going to give people a ship, which was extremely expensive, go take a look at a ship. I mean, in the, you know, that was handmade. These things are extreme investment of resources. Are you going to take a ship? give it to people, say, sail east and go find stuff. There's a problem around that. There's concerns around that. How far east? How many supplies do you pack? What's, what does success look like? And so the fact that e Columbus even got somebody to fund his, his voyages is a big surprise to all because that is a, it is a huge risk. And that's something else to think about is that that sea voyage of Columbus is a huge risk. And you only often take huge risks if you're in a position of, you know, of desperation. And in some ways, that's what you could look at Europe is Europe's attempt to send people into an ocean they had no clue where it was on the other end is an act of desperation because they are in desperate times. They are fighting amongst themselves. They are fighting with their neighbors and they've been cut off from some of the major supplies in the world. All right, so what about the Americas? So we've talked about Europe coming to the Americas. Well, what was there before they arrived? You know, what is there when Columbus does arrive? Well, we have the League of Nations in the Northeast, and this is a collection of uh, Native American different tribes that have created this League of Nations, and they are harvesting. They are using the lands in dynamic ways. They are conducting trade. And we don't often talk about that or recognize that, but that's an important piece of the world that was here before. We have the Aztecs, who is this vast empire of millions of people uh, who uh, in, in uh, Central America, who are, you know, one of the largest empires in the world at the time in terms of population. We also have the Incas, who is, you know, who is the largest or is the fastest growing empire in South America. In fact, they have a standing army of 80,000 people, 80,000 soldiers ready to fight at any given time. We also see this major resource siege that takes place with the Europeans as they come to the Americas taking a lot of things. They take a lot of whatever gold and silver they can find, lots of herbs and spices. They also take humans, right? That they're in, in all of this contributes to the rise of Europe as a powerhouse in the last 500 years. Without this, Europe would not have been the powerhouse that it is. We see a major ecological exchange take place where lots and lots of goods, lots and lo uh, of natural goods. So the sweet potato and potato and other vegetables from the Americas make their way 
and revolutionize diets the world around. Same with what goes on in the rest of the world in that Europe brings over wheat, Europe brings over cows and horses, right? The Americas had never had cows or horses. They had had llamas, but they had not had any other major uh, large herbivore. Um, mammal on their continent. And so we see this ecological exchange in which the whole world benefits because they find these these food crops are find new niches throughout the world in which to thrive and increase the food production throughout. So we see that with animals and we see that with plants. Um, we unfortunately ultimately see that with germs and that we see you know we see the American populations wiped out, you know significantly wiped out by the germs brought over by the Europeans. And they were wiped out by germs, particularly things like smallpox and measles, that Europeans and other civilizations had acquired from living in close proximity to things like cows and chickens, right? We call it chicken pox because it derives from chickens. So there is, you know, there's this exchange and it is at sometimes really beneficial and at sometimes extremely horrible. So what other major considerations do we want to think about um, as we look at the conquest and colonization of the Americas? And I use that word conquest and colonization because, well, for some people, they, they label what the Spanish did as a conquest, but what, the, the, you know, what England did as colonization, and my question would be, what is the difference there? Well, some of the major considerations is that printing press and the print culture that comes from it. With the printing press in the 1400s, you do create the ability for the word for the word to be mass reproduced, and with that mass reproduction, means that more and more people are going to learn to become literate, and are going to be reading more. And when you have a more literate population, and when you have the the printing press, you can do things like advertise, and that's one of the most earliest things that was done with the printing press was to advertise. So people were advertising to come to the US, you know, to come to the colonies and start a new life or, or to, you know, make your fortune, those kind of things. We also saw print culture allow for Bibles. And this was important because as Christians came over, of course they would want access to the Bible. They would want act they wanted to be, be able to hold and have a Bible with them. And we also started seeing Bibles, of course, published in different languages. No longer was it just Latin. And then finally, we saw an increase. Print culture allowed for an increase in education. We're still at a time in which you don't see massive education that you will see in the 18 and 1900s, but you do see a rise in education. You do see people, you know, more people become literate than they ever were before, right? So we see an increase in literacy. Again, we're not going to see major literacy like we see today, but we do see people start to read more. And because we have a printing culture, and because we have a printing press, people start to write more. And so with the birth of more writing, we're going to have much more literature. And so these are the foundations of American literature, right? Born from war and ecological exchange and religious uh, rebellion and technology. All right, thank you very much.